Hi everyone, welcome back to the Pro MMA Betting Podcast. So we're going to go through the UFC Norfolk card coming up this Saturday from top to bottom as we always do. Quick recap on how members got on last week. So we had a double dose, well a triple dose of live betting. We had the boxing in the UK on Friday night, we had the UFC on Saturday night and we managed to catch the last couple of fights on the Fury Wilder card after the UFC had finished. So live betting on Friday night, we went uh, two and two. We should have been three and one. The worst decision I've ever seen. A French fighter called Mamoun got absolutely robbed in London. We live bet Mamoun. I was a hundred percent confident he was getting a decision. I was not concerned at all and. Britain can be pretty bad for judging against foreign fighters, but I, I was not worried at all in this particular fight. It, it, I think it is the worst decision I've ever seen. So we lost on that absolutely ridiculously. So instead of being three and one and in profit on the night for the live betting, we ended up being two and two and down half a unit. UFC live betting went well. We went three and zero on our UFC bets. Um, so it was quite a low volume night. I'll tell you what we bet. We bet Kaikara France after round two. He was still around minus 187. I had him two rounds up. The, the books must have thought it was 1-1. One, one. Um, we bet Brad Riddell. I can't remember when we got him exactly. I think it was some point in round two. We got him at even money. And we managed to get a bet on Dan Hooker quite late in the fight. I think it was in round four, perhaps even round five. He wasn't far short of even money. I think we got around minus 140. All these bets are tracked, guys. You can find a link below the video. It's also a link on the website, prommabetting.com. So we went 3-0 on the UFC live bets, and we also managed to cash on the boxing. We bet Wilder Fury to finish under um, inside seven rounds or under seven rounds, so you had until the start of round eight, basically, and luckily the fight finished in round seven. We live bet that around, maybe round three or four, uh, so that came in for us as well. So overall, we took home on, on live betting across the weekend. I think it was around about three units profit, just slightly under, and our only pre-bet of the weekend was Keenan Song on the UFC against Callum Potter. We had two units on that at minus 160. Um, comfortable victory there for Song. So overall, members took home over over four units profit, getting up there for four and a half units. So good weekend overall. Guys, it's £195 for 12 months. You get full access to live betting tips, full access to pre-betting pit tips. We live bet on boxing and the UFC. Pre-bets for the UFC mainly. We do have some other cards thrown in sometimes. Bellator, Cage Warriors. Um, some pre-bets on boxing as well. But you're looking at around, in terms of pre-bets and live betting, over the course of a year you're looking at around 100 shows approximately. So lots and lots of opportunity to make money. Last year, guys that use £100 units won 14500 utilizing our live betting and pre-betting service. Now there are options available to sign up for a week, for a month, six monthly and annually. A lot of people jump in first with the monthly just to get a flavor. All I can say is obviously, you know, I don't expect people to jump in straight away and pay for the yearly. But this service is tailored as a as a yearly service. I like people to think of it as a stock market. A one month subscription may not give you a a proper flavor of the service because just like the stock market there's peaks and troughs I don't win on every event it's impossible to do so all of our results are tracked there's tracker links below this video they're also on the website pro betting.com what I do say is that we do win over the year and much like the stock market at the moment the stock market's crashing so you're not going to be getting a good return on your money at the moment but things even out, things turn around and profit is made. And it's just like MMA and boxing betting. We have some periods of time where we maybe don't do so well, but the good times outweigh the bad times. And as I've said, last year members got a great return on investment and we're aiming to do something similar this year. But you've got to view the the, the membership with us as a 12-month membership. And 95% of our members do, 95% of them 
have signed up for the 12 month membership we've got over 100 members guys we've got some great camaraderie going on in the private discord chat room for the live betting service we've got live betting this week on the ufc the boxing clashes with the ufc this week and ufc always gets priority we've got a pre-bet out with members and it's just a great opportunity to make money guys um you know our results speak for themselves you can as i keep saying you can check the trackers below you can check them on the website it's only 195 pounds for 12 months i know i've got competitors out there that charge 200 dollars per month you're getting that basically for for 12 months with my service I'm not saying that's going to last forever it's not because based on the return on investment i'm giving away my service so prices will be increasing but you can lock in 12 months at the moment for 195 pounds as i've said all results are tracked guys i also post my bet slips and stakes on twitter i like to prove that i'm not paper trading i like to prove that i'm betting what i'm tipping and i like to prove that i'm betting large amounts so i'm not just passing out bets for you guys to bet to bet my balls are on the table as well i don't see anyone else posting their bet slips if they do they cover up the stakes it's all very cloak and dagger, um, the, the MMA tout business, in fact the tout business in general. I don't like the word tout, but that's what most people refer to it as. So I'm trying to bring transparency to the sector and no one will catch me out for a lack of transparency. Uh, website is ProMMABetting.com, packages can be found on there. You can DM me on Twitter, any questions, at ProMMABetting. Please hit the subscribe button and the like button if you like this video. And we're now going to move on to the card, guys. We're going to work from bottom to top. I don't think it's a great card for betting. Um, as a fan, I don't think it's the best card either. But we'll work our way through as we always do. First fight on the card. Surprise, this is the first fight. I didn't think this would be on Fight Pass. We've got Ismail Nurdiev taking on Sean Brady. Two promising prospects at well to wait here, so does surprise me it's on fight pass. I think it'll be a good fight as well. Nordiev has a two inch reach advantage here. Leverages three and a half strikes per minute. Sean Brady's up at almost eight, but it's just based off of one UFC fight, so hard to read too much into that. Nordiev averages 1.7 takedowns per 15 minutes, 83% takedown accuracy. Sean Brady averages two, but again, just based on the one fight, 66% takedown accuracy. He's takedown defense at 100%, but again, just based on the Court McGee fight, and Nordiev is uh, 76%. So, good fight, two prospects, Sean Brady's unbeaten. Um, hard to get a full read on him for me. Um, I remember I struggled to get a great deal of tape in before his UFC debut and then he fought Court McGee who's a, a good person to make a UFC debut against Court is on a bit of a decline but he's tough he's in your face he sets a good pace uh, Sean Brady did slow down in that fight but it is Court McGee who as I said does push a higher pace it was his UFC debut we have seen him win a fight in the fourth round prior to his UFC debut so a couple of decisions as well before that over three rounds so I don't want to say that he's going to gas we could say the same about Nordiev we we've seen him slow down um in him in his first two UFC fights against Prezerez and then in his second fight against Chance where I think he just lacked a little bit of seasoning came out a bit too heavy I mean Prezerez is a tough fight he took that on short notice Prezerez is a, a ball of a man um so I don't think it's a bad reflection that he slowed in that fight and he still won that fight as well against Prezeras. Um against Chance he he seemed to come out thinking he could knock Chance put a beating on Chance but Chance survived and then he took over with his wrestling and we saw him a little bit more measured in his last fight against Seal where he took a, a three round decision so he, he showed there that he can go to three rounds without absolutely gasping for air and he's two of his three fights in the UFC he's won two of them by decision so um, he's finding his feet in the UFC. I don't really see much grappling happening in this fight. I'd have to give the wrestling edge, I think, to Nordiev. But I just see this fight playing out on the feet. With kind of Nordiev's kickboxing against the, the boxing of Brady. 
I think for Brady to win, he's going to have to pressure Nordiev here. He's going to have to try and take his kicks away from him, try and get in as close as possible and let his hands go. I know some people managed to get Brady in the plus 150, plus 160 area. I think that I think they are solid odds. Uh, the lines evened out a lot more now. We've got, let's have a look where the lines are sitting currently as we speak. And Nordiev's a minus one two five favourite, so it's probably going to be a pick 'em line by a fight night. So you know, this I don't really see much value on this fight now. I'm going to pick Brady just because he's got the plus number. I don't have a particularly strong lean here. Um, I don't feel I have a a full read on Sean Brady at the moment. Nordiev is only 23, so he should be improving. I think he's still doing some of his camp at least over at the Black Zillions or Combat Club, whatever they're called now. Sean Brady trains over on the, the New York scene. He's got an affiliation with Henzo Gracie. He's a, I think he's a Henzo Gracie black belt as well. So, you know, he's very competent on the mat. But I just see this playing out on the feet. I'm, it'd be interesting to see kind of how their cardio looks. This fight will hopefully give me a, a fuller read on particularly Brady, who I still feel I'm a little bit unsure about. But it's a fight that I'm very much looking forward to, and a great opener on the fight past prelim. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick Brady just because he's the dog here. As I said, I don't think there's any value now. But if you did manage to get the plus 150, plus 160, I think that's a solid bet. Albeit it still wouldn't have been a bet I'd go big on because th there's a lot of unknowns here. But I'm going to lean with Brady. He's a young guy himself. I think he's 27, so he should still be adding to his game and improving. So Brady probably by decision. Nordiev's a, a tough guy. Um, but he's clearly worked on his weaknesses. We saw him lose a few years ago over in Russia. He just got wrestled by a Brazilian for three rounds. Preservas did get him down, but he made him work for those takedowns. He was actually reversing Preservas. Preservas was uh, he was trying to advance his position too much, and Nerdiev was just timing him as he was trying to advance and reversing position. Um, as we saw against Chance, if you kind of just hold position against him, he, he didn't show much of his back. But I'm not sure Brady's going to be able to get him down in the first place anyway. I, I just see this fight plan out on the feet and. Brady has to pressure and, and close the gap so those he can't get those kicks off. But it's definitely a close fight. But I'll go with Brady to win a decision here. Um, next fight, we've got Alon Cruz taking on late notice replacement Spike Carlisle. Cruz, there's not a massive amount of tape on him. I managed to find his contender series fight, which was back in July, which he won with a flying knee in the third round. And I also found the Damon Blackshear fight which he lost in the fourth round. While we're going now, we're going back like two and a half years. He kind of got wobbled on the feet and then basically Blackshear followed up and, and managed to submit in. At struck, um, the guy he faced on the contender series for three rounds. He's very kick heavy, he's very tall, very rangy fighter. He's got a big reach advantage over Spike Carlisle with about seven inches so you know the plan here for him is going to be fight long and use those long kicks um, he's very kick heavy legs over hands for Cruz um, he's 30 years of age as well so he's he's not really this young prospect so I'm not sure how much better he's going to get Spike Carlisle in on short notice here a very very heavy wrestle approach he's going to come in and try and wrestle Cruz straight off the bat I, I don't hold Spike high at all. I don't think he's UFC quality. Big concerns over his cardio. He'll try and wrestle you and then his wrestling's not even that effective. If he does get you down, people seem to be able to get back up. Not really sold on this guy from what I've seen on tape. Um, against Brian Del Rosario, in round two he attempted a, a takedown. Rosario hit bumped him straight into mount. Had his back, but Kyle slipped out the back door and then got Rosario's back and choked him. But I saw clips of his split decision loss. Looks like he couldn't get his wrestling game going fully and was getting outstruck on the feet. So, yeah, I've got to go with Cruz here. Um, I'm a, I mean, I'm not fully sold on Cruz either. I, I, that Blackshear fight just repeats in my head him getting rocked on the feet and then and then choked out, but it. 
it was two and a half years ago and I, I think he'd be a decent guy in his um, contender series fight the guy he was fighting was from a real solid camp from I think it was from Fortis and you know I wasn't blown away by the performance but he's just one of them rangy awkward strikers and I, I just think he's got a wrestling background I just don't rate Spike at all here I think he'll give it a go in round one uh, you know like I said even if he does get you down his top control doesn't seem great he, he's short notice he's probably going to guess out so I have to go with Cruz here but I just can't pull the trigger on Cruz at, uh, he's minus 185 now um, I, I think he I mean he opened at like minus 130 I think around that kind of range probably would have taken a risk on Cruz I wouldn't have gone big because uh, I'm not fully sold on him yet either but Spike is just someone that I, I just think he's going to I don't think he's going to get a win in the UFC but the line's just a bit wide for me now but minus 130 I, I would have probably taken a unit or so on that um, but yeah, I've got to pick Cruz here even though I, I don't really think there's much value left on the money line I, I think Cruz wins this fight um, next fight we've got let me just check Wikipedia for the order yeah so the last fight on the fight pass fight past prelims we've got um, another guy coming through from the contender series TJ Brand taking on Jordan Griffin um, I like Jordan Griffin as a fighter um, he's very scrappy aggressive as a better his fight IQ is is very questionable and as a better it really puts you off betting him especially as a favourite we saw in both the Ige and Skelly fights questionable fight IQ like against Dan Ige shot for a takedown in round 3 I don't know why he was doing fine on the feet um, I mean ultimately Ige stuffed the takedown and it, it, you know it, that sequence didn't cause him to lose that third round but it's just then he done some stuff against Chaz Skelly as well now I'm struggling to remember everything because I taped this fight a couple of weeks ago but I remember at one point I think it's in round three when it's you know the fights he's either two rounds down or perhaps one all he goes for a he drops down for a guillotine it's just you know it's 2020 man you, you can't be dropping for guillotines they're really they're really hard to pull off in this day and age um, there's other there's other moments as well where he's just shown some poor fight IQ. I can't remember them now off the top of my head because, as I said, I've, I taped this a couple of weeks ago. But when you're a better, you can't really be betting on people, especially as favourites, when they've got that questionable fight IQ. Now, if I knew Jordan Griffin would come out here with sole focus on striking and defending takedowns, I'd, I'd I'd be tempted. Um, you know, he fought through the submission attempts from Skelly really well. Skelly had that rear naked choke fully locked in. You know, he's a tough guy. Dan Ige nearly had the choke locked in as well. He survived that. He's he's a tough, scrappy guy. He trains out of um, Pettis' gym. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But it's just that fight IQ. Um, TJ Brown, this is a step up in competition for him. TJ Brown's had a professional boxing fight, but I, I definitely favour Griffin on the feet here. I'm not sold on TJ Brown's chin either. Uh, we saw him get dropped heavily in the first round against Dylan Lockhart. Um, he's got a KO loss back in February 2018 to Cody Carrillo, who's a, a 13 and 18 fighter. So I'm I'm definitely a little bit dubious. About about his chin but he's got a good grappling game um, decent takedowns good control on the mat um, you can see that he is a stronger grappler than striker so I just see this fight being very scramble heavy high paced it might come down to Jordan Griffin's fight IQ I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Jordan here even though I can't bet him because I can't trust him as a favorite I'm going to go with him here. I think he can give TJ Brown problems on the feet. And I think on the grand, it could be a very scramble-heavy fight. Um, Jordan did take a round off Dan Ige from keeping him on his back. So he is competent from top position. In round two against Skelly, he was having a lot of success. He managed to mount Skelly. So he, he's a he, he's decent from top position. But it's just the, the fight IQ um, that I just don't trust. But I'm going to go with Jordan Griffin to win this fight. Um probably by decision but he could put TJ away he does throw with some heat and TJ's chin you know not fully solving it but I don't have a full 
I don't feel I have a full read on TJ Brown yet. You know, on the Contender Series, he's got that win, but how good is Dylan Lockhart? I just don't know. And then the other fights that are available, like you can watch the the Pete Barrett fight. He gets dropped in that fight as well, actually. Um, but again, how good's Pete Barrett? We saw him on the Contender Series, but you know, it's just hard to get a read on these these guys. For me personally, as a better. Um, especially if I'm gonna, there's money involved. So I'm going to lean with Jordan Griffin here, but Fight IQ is a, a big question mark. Next, we've got oh, my favourite guy's low level heavyweight fight Marcin Tibora taking on Sergei Spivak. I'll be completely honest, I haven't done tape on this fight, guys, because I knew I would not be betting it. Um, the Marcin Tibora for a heavyweight is a decent grappler, but the guy has just fallen off a cliff like he seems in serious serious decline um he's definitely going to get cut if he loses here i mean he's only 34 he's only had 23 fights but i mean he's been knocked out four times and they're all well three of them are in his last four fights so you basically look at his last five fights uh Fabricio Verdum outstruck him for five rounds Derek Lewis Knocked him out in the third round in a fight that Tybora was winning. He was two rounds up. Stefan Struve managed to win a decision, but he got he got hurt badly at one point in that fight as well. And then he's coming off back-to-back -back KO losses to Shamil Abdukiram Mimov and Sakai. And, you know, losing decisions to them guys, but... Getting knocked out by them is not a great look. I'm really worried about his durability. He just seems he seems shot on a big decline. So guys, Spivak, we saw him UFC debut got blown away by Walt Harris, um, but he came back and won against Ty to Avassa last time out. As I said, I've not done tape, but I, I can't pick Ty Bora. I think he's just shot. Um, Spivak's going to be the younger, hungrier, fresher guy here. He's the favourite now. Whether you want to lay money on a low level heavyweight fight like this where someone's a favorite i don't know but i'm gonna i'm gonna pick spivak just because i've just got no faith left in what typora has got left hope he wins it'll save his job but I, i'm gonna go with Sp spivak here next solid fight this one middleweight division we've got brendan allen taking on tom brace now as a better I know there's a lot of people that seem to like Tom Brees here and I, I can understand it kind of from a from a skills perspective but I'm going to give you some reasons why I'm not betting Tom Brees in this fight and why I'm actually personally leaning Brendan Allen here so we all know about uh, Tom Brees's anxiety issues if you don't he, he suffers from severe anxiety just before a fight um, it's been numerous occasions let me just go to Tapology because that'll tell me the fights that have been cancelled where he's pulled out of fights on fight week. Off the top of my head, I think it was the... I can't remember the guy's name. He was meant to fight. I think that was in London. Uh, the War Angel guy. Um, I think he pulled out day before against the War Angel. Right, let's have a look. Here we go. So, there was no problems at first. So, he had the Sean Strickland fight. He lost a very close split decision. Could have gone either way. Then he was meant to fight in March 2017 against the War Angel. That I remember that was the kind of day of or day before due to the anxiety. Um, then he had his first fight in two years against Dan Kelly. Was that in Australia? Let's have a look. Oh no, it was in Liverpool. So he was at home there against Dan Kelly. And then just a string of cancelled fights. So he's had one, two, three, four four fights cancelled since the Dan Kelly fight now I can't remember the reason for all of them I definitely know that Ian Heinish fight was cancelled because he had an anxiety attack literally a day or two before the fight um, he was also meant to fight Cesar Vajaya, Adicio Di Chirico and uh, Cesar Vajaya again but I can't remember why they were cancelled but yeah he has this issue before the fights now as a as a Kappa, I can't put a percentage on how much that is going to affect him. Um, as people have pointed out, when he's full, it hasn't seemed to affect him in the ring. So it's something that I'm not going to factor it into my cap in here because it's just impossible to put a percentage on it and it hasn't affected him when he's actually got in the ring. But I, I personally just can't be backing someone where, you know, the mental side of fighting is absolutely huge. 
I can't back someone with the kind of uh, mental health issues that Brees seems to have and that anxiety he seems to have with regards to actually getting in there and fighting. Um, you can see he's had a couple of grappling competitions, but th that's nowhere near the same as a, a fight. I've done grappling competitions and I've competed as well, and the feeling is just completely different. So, yeah, I just don't know where he's at in that sense. He's come off social media as well, you know, so closing that down isn't a great sign to me. Um, so I don't know. And also one other thing here is uh, Brendan Allen is a very um, in-your-face kind of fighter. He's going to push a pace. He's going to come at you. When you look at Brees' record, he's never fought anyone like that. He's not really been tested. Um, he had a close fight with Sean Strickland, don't be wrong, and he, he lost that decision. But, it, you know, it was a... It wasn't the best fight, um, you know. Strickland didn't really put it on him. Brendan Allen is gonna uh, pull it on him. He hasn't, you know, he's had it all his own way in the UFC. His first a uh, couple of opponents were a level below him. Then he fought Nakamura, um, turned into a bit of a grappling match. Nakamura was way, way smaller than Brees. Cause remember, Brees used to fight a welterweight. Then he had that Strickland fight. Then Dan Kelly fight put him away quickly. So you know he's not really been pushed. So when you when you think about the anxiety and everything he has, I wonder how he does hold up when he's dragged into a dog fight, which he could be here. And I don't get me wrong, he's the better striker. He could catch Brendan Allen trying to come in and put him away. Um, but if he's dragged into a dog fight, it just brings me back to the the mental health side. And just how how is he going to hold up under under that kind of pressure? So, uh, yeah, I just can't get behind Tom. I need to see him back in the ring, see how he looks. And, I mean, even all that aside, like I said, I've just not seen him dragged into a dogfight. And, and Brendan Allen, although he is loose positionally, you know, he's very opportunistic submission-wise. Now, I know Kevin Holland gets a lot of slack, but Holland's an awkward guy to look good against. And to put him away is pretty impressive. So to get that round two sub... Um, I was quite impressed and I uh, you know I watched his contender series fight he's in your face you know he's going to make it a dog fight and I've seen the Anthony Hernandez fight before I didn't rewatch really it uh, on this occasion but I've seen it before it was you know very up and down he can like I said he is loose positionally he can get taken down one can only hope that that is an aspect he is working on. He is only 24 years of age, so he's still very, very young. Um, but he does train out of Duke Rufus's gym, which, you know, they do get a little bit of slack for their their kind of wrestling and grappling side. Like, the striking's great there, but Brendan Allen is more of a grappler, but he is more kind of submission over position, whereas from what we can tell from Tom Brees' game against Nakamura he's more of a, a position guy and he's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt as well so he does seem competent on the mat he does a lot of grappling competitions does Tom but I'm going to go with Brendan Allen here he's the underdog I think he's uh, scrappy he's going to fight for your money he's very opportunistic Tom Brees has seen, hasn't seen the second round of a fight in four years and you know how many times has he fought in the last four years we've got the Strickland fight which was you know almost four years ago he said you know this will be his third fight in four years and like I said we haven't he hasn't seen a round two since that Strickland fight which is almost four years ago so these are just all concerns for me so I'm going to go with Brendan Allen here to win probably a, a, a very competitive close decision and let's hope, I actually hope Tom makes it to the cage, Joe, because that would be a big hurdle for him to overcome and it would be good for him moving forward. So I just hope he makes it to the cage, because if he doesn't, I'm sure that would be his last chance from the UFC. Uh, Gabriel Silva, Kyler Phillips, guys, I'll be honest here, I haven't taped this fight. Um, I did watch Silva against Ray Borg uh, the other week, because uh, I bet Ray Borg and um, Gabriel Silva, he's Eric Silva's brother, for those that don't know. Um, he gave a very good account of himself for the first round and a half. He was winning that fight, um, but he just started to slow down a bit, much like his brother. And it allowed Ray Borg to take over, but it was a, it was a very solid showing. Um, I've taped Kyler Phillips in the past, because... I don't know whether he was meant to be on the Contender Series, let's have a look, or whether he was meant to make his UFC debut before. But I definitely had a look at, look at him previously, and I remember I was struggling to get a proper read on him from the tape that was available. Um, I think he's been on the Contender Series, let's have a look. Ah, so he was meant to fight Ray Balk. Is that who Silver therefore replaced? Let's have a look. What date was that fight? 
no it wasn't um, Silver fought him four months later but yeah he was meant to fight Ray Borg so that's why I did tape him um, I remember I did find his fight with Victor Henry where he lost a split decision and I watched his fight with Brad Katona my memory of them is not great um, I think he gassed against Victor Henry if I remember right but it, he's a young guy um, you know he's going to be making improvements it's it, it's just one of them where I thought it was going to be a hard one for me to get a, a solid read on and I saw a lot of people jump on Silver when he was the dog and by the time I kind of got round to the fight he he changed to the favourite so I just left it so I'm not going to make a prediction guys I can't really talk about this fight in great detail all I can say is Silver he, he, he made a good account of himself in his debut against Ray Borg who is an extremely difficult person to look good against if you can't keep him off you and outstrike him Silver actually out grappled him for a round and a half so he's clearly a competent grappler I just can't really say how this fight will go on, on the feet and then you've got Silver possibly slowing down but as I said I remember Phillips slowing down in that, that decision loss he's got so it's so, a so past fight for me there guys um, I haven't delved deep into it good luck if you're betting it another fight where I can't honestly make a solid call on it guys because I haven't taped it Steve Goss has literally just been announced as the replacement opponent for Munoz, a fight I did spend a couple of hours taping, it's so frustrating when this happens. Um, I'm kind of familiar with um, Garcia, he's definitely not been given a gimme here, has Louis Pena. Garcia is a competent fighter, trains out of Jackson Wink, which honestly seems like a bit of a negative in this day and age, unfortunately. I'm just going to bring up his record. He's got a very quick loss to Alon Cruz, who we've already discussed, but that fight's not available. But it's literally within a minute. I think it's just one of them fights where you just get caught early. It doesn't necessarily mean much if they fought again. You know, it's probably very unlikely that that happens again. But you know, it happens, especially in MMA. People do that do have normally it's a quick knockout loss, but maybe you got dropped and then it was a club and sub type fight. But He's he's not a mug Garcia. He's a big. Um, he used to fight like bantamweight. I don't know how he used to make bantamweight. He's a big guy. Um, so he's taking this fight at lightweight against Louis Pena in on very short notice, literally a few days. Uh, he only fought back in mid January, so he fought about six six weeks ago. But uh, who knows what kind of shape he's in now? I'm just seeing if this is his first fight at. Lightweight. Looks like he's always fought at bantamweight or featherweight. Like I said, he's a very big bantamweight. Um, but he is fighting up a division here as well. So, I mean, look, I've got to lean with Louis uh, Pena just because it's such short notice. And I don't think Pena's a bad fighter. He's got decent pressure. He just doesn't let his hands go enough. And when he does, he's a little bit predictable. Um, he's easy to take down but he's very very scrambly very unorthodox he's also switched up camps he's not an AKA anymore he's done this camp at American Top Team so that would be interesting um, very close loss to Matt Frivola I've not got a problem with the decision there um, and, but you know it, he kind of seemed to be in control of and threw away he has good cardio now he's got some good attributes, Louis. He seems to have a solid chin as well, albeit he's hittable. He's got a bit of that of tall man defence. Um, the odds were released on this fight. Let's see where they're sitting at the moment. So we've got um, Louis Pena's basically minus 300 favourite. Yeah, I, I can't be backing him as a big favourite. So I wouldn't play it, guys. I, I personally wouldn't put him in doubles, etc. But I'm going to pick Louis Pena here to win this fight. We've got Grant Dawson taking on Derek Minner, another late notice replacement. This card's one of them where it's just, you know, it's been a lot of movement on the card. Uh, Mina came in, I think he got announced at the start of the week. Grant's meant to have fought uh, Chaskelly back in January, then he was rescheduled for this card, but I think did Skelly drop out injured in the end? He's, Dawson's had some USADA problems that seem to have been sorted out now. He trains over with James Kraus. Um, Grant Dawson, look, he's a work in progress. He definitely needs to work on his striking. Um, it's a weakness for him, but he's one of these guys that just comes out, sets a ferocious pace. Um, he's got, you know, I don't think his wrestling is going to work at the higher level of this division, but 
against the types of opponents he's been facing so far. He, he's been able to take them down at will. Um, he's good from top position. Um, he's dangerous with his submissions. The guy's a finisher. Um, let me just go to both their records. I don't think Dawson's ever been the distance. Oh, he's got one decision win. And his loss was the uh, was a KO loss. So he's one decision win. Oh, yeah, of course, against Julian Arosa. Otherwise, he's finished every fight. So he is a finisher. Um, and he got a good win over uh, Trezano last fight. Got him down and just murked him on top. Derek Minna, very much a glass cannon. Uh, another guy that doesn't see a decision very often. He's had 34 fights. He's been to a decision three times. Um, he's last. Let's have a look at his record here. Let's go to Sherdog's. It's a bit easier to see. Um, he's asked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. He's asked 11 fights, have finished inside the distance. And all but they've all finished inside two rounds, the last 11 fights. So, you know, I've done a bit of tape on him. I remember taping him for the Contender Series. He's, I mean, he's, his record basically indicates what type of fighter he is. He's, he's, he's more of a grappler. He's got a good guillotine choke. He's only got the one KO win, um, but 21 submission wins from 24 fights. He'll come out and hunt that submission. Um, he had a decent start against uh, Herbert Burns on the Contender Series, but he just, as good as he is offensively as a grappler, he just doesn't seem very good defensively. Um, I went and watched the Kevin Croom fight. I mean, it was a bit of a premature stoppage against Kevin Croom. Kevin Croom had his had his back and um, was putting in some ground and pound, but it was definitely a, a premature stoppage. But he does very much seem like the kind of guy that if he can't get that quick win, he, he kind of folds pretty easily. He's got 10 losses and 9 are inside the distance. If you look at his losses as well, so Herbert Burns was in the first round after a good start. Kevin Croom, premature stoppage, but the tide had turned um, and Kevin Cream funnily enough is a James Krause guy so even though Min is in on short as a short notice replacement here to take on Dawson um, I imagine Krause will be familiar with Minna because he did corner him against Kevin Kroom. Um that fight was about 18 months ago um, Jordan Griffin he lost in the second round to um, Fernando Padilla I mean even his losses are just <laughs> first round losses or second round um, there's a few second round losses here which you know, just kind of paints a bit of a picture that you know if he can't get that quick win he does seem to fold and I just personally think Dawson's going to come out here should be careful uh, with the takedowns because of that guillotine but I just think he's going to take him down and I think he's just going to finish him with either ground and pound or, or sink in a rear naked choke from the top position so I'll go with Dawson Dawson is a big favourite though as expected, he's like minus 470 at 5 dimes and even the inside the distance props, I was holding out for them but fight doesn't go to a decision, he's minus 400 now, um, it'd be interesting to see what the over under is on the 1.5, fight to start round 2 is minus 125 so you've got to imagine that under, even that's going to be juiced, so you're probably looking at minus 160 maybe for the under which you know isn't great but uh, I don't know I don't know if I'd want to play that I'd definitely take it at evens but I mean I definitely think this fight finishes inside the distance it's just and I think it will be done within two rounds so I guess then you've only got two and a half minutes against you so I don't know let's see where the line falls but I'm interested in where the over under is there Dawson um Dawson by TKO plus 320 could ground and pound him um, or I do favour the submission which is minus 110 but there's not really any value there um, Dawson wins inside the distance is sitting at minus 250 now that's gone so I think the over under is the only possible value we can find on that fight guys um, I just thought as well I've not been going through the odds with you guys on these fights uh, in terms of fights going the distance and so forth so let me just have a quick scan through to see if there is anything I like can't say there is much I like really so that's um, probably why I kind of just commented on the money lines and moved on um, so yeah like I said at the start though I'm, I'm not in love with this card for betting 
Uh, right, on to the next fight. So next we've got Megan Anderson against Norma Dumont. So Megan, uh, she trains with Grant Dawson. They're both with James Krause. There's a lack of tape on Norma. There's nothing from the last couple of years. Uh, so it's a very hard fight to be confident in. I can't bet the fight because Megan, as we know, weakness is on the ground. Norma does seem to have Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu background. There's some grappling videos out there. So it's a pass fight for me. Um, Megan minus 230. I mean, it might look like a good line on reflection, but it's just really difficult to get a read on Norma. And, and Megan is hard to trust, but I've, I've got to pick... Megan here but as I say with the lack of tape available I don't recommend betting it um, fight doesn't go to oh fight doesn't go to decision is minus 200 really women's MMA I know Megan finishes but that does surprise me um, Megan to win inside the distance even money uh, yeah, there's no value on that fight. Um, right, let's move on to the next fight, which is for me, outside of the main event, the best fight on the card. Eon Kutilaba taking on Magomed Ankalaev. Really, really looking forward to this fight. Ankalaev is a man that I am a, a strong believer in, even though I did bet him against Paul Craig, and that fight will haunt me until the day I stop betting on MMA. Um, was comfortably winning the fight and gets tapped with literally one second left. Incidentally, same night, guys, I live betted Leon Edwards to win a decision against Sabota. And what happened? Fight was stopped with one second left of round three. Absolutely unbelievable night. So, um, yeah, so Ankalev is forever it, it, uh, tattooed on my on my betting sleeve. But he's a very competent fighter. Um, what I didn't like, I didn't like, it was a bit of an instant tap. I didn't really like that. I mean, when he must have known the fight was almost over. Did he hear the clapper? You know, just the whole, I just don't understand why he tapped. But that fight aside, uh, he's, I mean, I didn't think he looked that great in that fight anyway, to be completely honest. Like, Paul Craig got him down a couple of times, and I didn't think his striking looked overly sharp. I don't know. Maybe we put it down to, to UFC jitters. But, I mean, he's he's looked better every fight since. And, I mean, the guy's not lost, besides getting tapped in the last second, the, the guy's not lost a round in the UFC. Um, he put away Marcin Prashino. Oh, wow, really nice. Caught him with a lovely right hook. Slipped to the side. Caught him with a right hook. Put him away with a head kick. Clits in a brew. Just comfortably out Falklitz and Abreu over the three rounds. Broke his nose in um, round one. That didn't seem to help Abreu at all. Um, Abreu, he shut down Abreu's grappling. He had some top position control um, against the fence. He controlled against the fence. Um, I noticed when people do put him on the fence, he reverses position quickly. And then against Dalsha, he just in full control of that fight. Put him away with an evil front kick at the start of round three. Um, something to note with Ankalaev is he fights opposite stance to his opponent. In MMA, I've never seen someone that's so comfortable and competent at fighting in either stance. I mean, he will literally spend the whole fight in... If he's fighting a southpaw fighter, he'll fight orthodox the whole fight. If he's fighting an orthodox fighter, he'll fight southpaw the whole fight. Now, Kutilaba is an orthodox fighter. I don't know why I fight metric lists him as a southpaw fighter he's not he's orthodox so Ankalive will fight southpaw in this fight um, I'm 99.9% .9 sure um, extremely competent in either stance which shows what kind of level this guy is at um, extremely skilled fighter um, He's a, he can be a little bit inactive on the feet but I think Kutalaba's type of aggression will play into Anchor Live's hands here. I think it's going to open up the combinations. He's got very quick hands, Anchor Live, when he throws them in combination. He's got a very quick high kick as well. Now that's going to be there for him in the southpaw stance against the orthodox Kutalaba. Kutalaba has proven that he's got a very solid chin. I don't think we've really seen him hurt in the UFC. Um, but He's very hittable, and Kutalaba is he's very strong in round one. He's definitely a technical 
disadvantage here without a shadow of a doubt he's he's done a little bit of training at Tiger Muay Thai but still trains predominantly in Moldova and I, I think Kutalaba's got a high ceiling because he's extremely tough he's durable he's very aggressive it's easy for the UFC to sell him for fights he's always in entertaining fights Kutalaba needs some world class trainers around him because he's got some holes in his game that I think they're not going to be fixed in Moldova. He he throws everything into every punch. And the knock-on effect of that is if he doesn't put guys away in the first round, he slows down every fight. Unless it's all one-way traffic, like the Jonathan Wilson fight, where he pretty much controlled the whole fight. If someone is coming back at him, um, well, we've seen it numerous times, he does slow down. And look, I do not want to be on the receiving end of, of punches from Kutalaba. I'm not saying he doesn't hit hard, but I just don't know how concussive his shots are because you know he floored Glover but that was with a spinning back fist so that's like a low percentage shot Glover kind of took everything else he threw um, obviously he did get the stoppage over Antigulov but I think that a lot of that was to do with Antigulov gassing and he, you know he didn't put Antigulov down it was a it, it was stopped standing and I, I think a lot of it was exhaustion obviously he did drop Frankenstein but I mean that guy just blocks punches with his face but Jared Cannonier and, and Jonathan Wilson both managed to go the distance with him uh, Misha Serkinov who is described as a uh, someone that can easily be broken actually broke uh, Misha uh, broke Kutalaba survived the first round I mean it was a competitive first round I still gave it to Misha uh, but then Kutalaba just slowed. He slowed against Serkinov because Serkinov fought back. So against Jared Cannonier because Jared Cannonier fought back. Um, he started to slow down against Glover Teixeira. Um, and he ended up losing all of these fights. Uh, he's a great hammer, but he doesn't seem to be a great now. He needs to learn how to be more efficient with his energy. You can't put everything into every shot. He's just trying to kill you with every shot. And I, I don't. It's not like he has that ridiculous kind of power where if he just lands once he puts you away anyway he needs to learn to manage his energy um, he needs to just and he's not he's he's not learning and developing his game in, in Moldova and that he got a good win over Khalil Roundtree Khalil Roundtree had a lot of hype coming off that win over Eric Anders but he came out he fought smart went for the takedown straight away and just you know en ended up pounding Khalil Roundtree out but Khalil Roundtree is still very much a, a work in progress, you know. But on the other flip side, Kutalaba has faced better competition in Ankalaev. Ankalaev hasn't really stepped up in the UFC yet, whereas Kutalaba does have in his back pocket Jared Cannonier fight, Misha Serkinov, Glover Teixeira, uh, like Khalil Roundtree. He's fought some decent names, so he has been in there, but you can definitely see where the weakness is for Kutalaba and it is that he does slow down and perhaps his punching power isn't as, as strong as he thinks it is he's got some decent wrestling he's got that Greco-Roman background but he needs to be careful he doesn't end up on his back here especially once he starts to slow because Ankalaev has very good ground and pound and he's going to pick Kutalaba apart if on the feet if Kutalaba starts to slow down so I am kind of in the in the camp of Kutalaba is round one or bust here. Now the question mark is Ankalaev's chin. It's never really been tested, but we did see him. I wouldn't say he was hurt, but he seems to get wobbled against both a brew. He got caught with a right hook, and he got caught with a big shot on the top of the head against Doucher. Um The only opponent that I think has really any similarity to. Kutalaba is Doucher just in the fact that he's an explosive fast guy but Kutalaba is a lot better than Doucher so Ankalaev needs to come out here he's, he's going to have to be smart the first round not get involved in a brawl use his combinations use good counters I was going to say maybe mix in the wrestling but I mean, if he can put Kutalaba on his back, right? You know, Kutalaba will probably work his way back to his feet, but it'll just wear on his gas tank. I just think the fight, the longer the fight goes, the more it favours Ankalaev. Um, we saw Ankalaev's line come down to, he was at minus 190 a couple of days ago. It's gone back up there. Let's have a look at the current live line. He's, he's back at minus 230 now. Um, some books still have him at minus 225. Pinnacle is minus 210. 
Um, I think the line's probably pretty fair now. Uh, I think value on this fire is... I personally like Anchor Live, but the line may be starting to get away now. Fight goes to a decision, plus 175. I'd, I'd be surprised if Anchor Live does put Kutalabra away. He's, he's very durable. But, as I said, he's a great hammer. He's perhaps not such a good now, and he did get submitted by Glover. Um, he did get submitted by Misha kind of as soon as the fights had turned. And Clive doesn't really have submissions on his record though. I think he's only got the one. So uh, unless he can get the ground and pound win or land kind of the perfect combination on the feet, it's, it's going to be hard to put him away. So so it, it's kind of interesting, plus 175, but it's going to be a massive sweat because uh, especially the way Kutalaba throws, he's going to throw bombs and then if he slows down and Clive potentially teeing off or he gets on top so it's going to be sweaty but plus 175 does feel a little bit high for me and Kalaev to win by decision is sitting at plus 250 which I, I don't think that's a bad line either if you like your props I mean obviously don't go big but I think there's kind of a bit of value on both of them but I'm going to go with and Kalaev probably by a decision here uh, Felicia Spencer Zara Fan. I haven't even looked at this fight guys I mean it's ridiculous minus 800 um, I, I, I don't think there's really much value in Zara though. We saw a, a, a massive women's MMA line the other week with Roxy. Roxy, of you know, a very competent fighter, very experienced. Zara fan just isn't very good. I, I think Felicia's going to win this pretty comfortably. No value on the money line, obviously. Um, Felicia Spencer to win inside the distance is currently sitting at minus 210. There's no value there. Felicia Spencer to win by a submission. Minus one. F uh, the lines are just suck. Pass on that fight, guys. I pick Spencer, but pass on the fight. Uh, main event there. Solid, solid main event. We've got Benavidez, Figueredo. Competing for the flyweight world title, so really looking forward to this fight. So, a quick bit about both guys. Figueredo has for a flyweight, he has uh, bricks in his hands, real, real heavy puncher. Uh, we've seen him in the UFC now for he's had how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I don't know, eight or nine fights in the UFC so far. Only lost to Formiga. Formiga basically won that fight by hitting takedowns and, and maintaining top control for enough time he had a disputed win over Jared Brooks who Jared Brooks managed to get him down numerous times but you know it's a close fight I don't think it was a robbery um, Figueredo got the decision uh, he was the guy that was kind of trying to finish the fight more he had some guillotines locked in off takedowns and stuff so I don't think it was the worst decision but the guy has shown that he has serious power in his hands um, put away Joseph Morales John Moraga uh, Pantoja took a beating in that fight um, done well to keep coming back um, and he's coming off that quick win over, over Tim Elliott he, he's got power in his hands he's quite low volume though Figueredo and you know the worry with him is is at flyweight it is, as much power as he does have it's still difficult to put people away and he, he's kind of it doesn't have massive volume so he could potentially, if he doesn't do damage, give rounds away. Um, Benavidez obviously was out for a few years. He came back from that ACL surgery. He looked uh, a bit rusty against Sergio Pettis, or did he? I'll come to that in a minute. Since then, he's had he's reeled off three wins. The Alex Perez win, that a bit of a weird one. It seemed like a headbutt was the beginning of the end for Perez there. But Benavidez still made a good start to that fight. He wasn't letting Perez bully him. Bully him. Perez didn't like it. Dustin Ortiz, very competitive fight with. Um, it looked like he was going to lose that fight, but he turned it around in round three. And then he's coming off the um, uh, solid TKO win over Formiga in his last fight. Um, the reason I mentioned the Sergio Pettis fight there is he, he struggled against Pettis. Now, it was his first fight after about 18 months off. He'd had the knee surgery, etc. So there is that ring rust factor. But it was a striker he was facing in, in Sergio Pettis. And... If you look at Benavides' record, I mean, outside of John Moraga, he hasn't really faced a striker outside of Demetrius Johnson. I mean, since the last 
Demetrius Johnson fight where he got knocked out in round one. He's fought Tim Idiot, Dustin Ortiz, both grapplers. John Morago had class as a, a boxer, but he's someone that Benavidez is a level above. Um, Bagatinov's a wrestler, Zach McCoskey's a wrestler, Henry Sahido is a wrestler for he's developed his striking game and I mean that fight did play out as uh, as pretty much a striking match but um, Sahido's improved a lot in the last few years that fight was you know three years ago um, then the fight with Sergio Pettis and then Alex Perez is more known for his wrestling Dustin Ortiz again and Formiga Grappler so it, this is an interesting fight in the, the stylistic component because Figueredo is not a, a grappler. He's he's a competent grappler, don't get me wrong, but he, he is a striker. This guy's going to come out and he's going to want to try and knock Joseph Benavidez out. Now, he's, Figueredo's loss was to Formiga, who managed to take him down and, and maintain enough uh, top control time, basically. It's not really Benavidez's game. His wrestling's okay. Can he get Figueredo down? I'm not 100% sure. If he does get him down, can he keep him down? I don't think he can because it's not Benavidez's game. He's more of a, a scramble type fighter. So if this fight is on the feet for five rounds now, Benavidez hits harder than one might think. I mean, he's he knocked out Formiga, I think, both times. They thought he put Formiga away. Yeah, both times he put Formiga away. Um, obviously, the Alex Perez fight is marred a bit by the headbutt, but he did still put Alex Perez away with strikes. Um, he was throwing like heat against Henry Sahido, but we've seen Sahido show himself to have a real solid chin. So, so even though he's got a lot of decision wins, he he, he does throw with heat. But at the same time, against a striker like Figueroa, he does come in with his chin up. Mighty Mouse spoke about how he has his eyes closed when he comes in to exchange. So he is there to be hit. And against a striker here, first proper striker he's faced outside of Sergio Pettis since uh, Mighty Mouse. It, it, it's just a little bit of a concern for me. So, you know, he's getting up there in age as well. But, he, I mean, he has looked okay. He has looked okay age-wise. It doesn't seem to have impacted him too much. But I'm going to lean, I'm going to go with Figueredo here to win this fight. Not a confident pick, but he is the underdog. He is sitting at plus one two five uh, on five times anyway. A lot of places he's plus one fifteen. But I just think from a style stylistic angle, it represents a, a, a different fight for Benavides to what he's pretty much used to. And the last two times he's faced, uh, you know, a, a good striker, he's he's lost those fights. And he got hurt against Sergio, and he got knocked out by Mighty Mouse. And Figueroa hits harder than both. Now he's maybe not as technical as Sergio and Mighty Mouse, and maybe the volume isn't quite as good. But the guy cracks for for someone at 125 pounds. Um, this is a five-round fight as well, so I just struggle to see Benavidez making it a. a I just he's not gonna I just don't see him having long periods of top control. I think it's gonna be very scrambly and I just think there's gonna be opportunities for Figueroa to catch him on the feet and I think he might put him away and even if he doesn't put him away, I just think kind of similar to the Pantoja fight, he might just do enough kind of damage when he does land to to win the rounds based on like impact and damage, even if it, his volume isn't quite matching Benavides's. But it is a it is a close fight. It's not one I'm confident in, but uh, I'm gonna go with my gut here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Figueredo just to cause problems being the striker, and it seems to be something Benavidez does struggle with. Um, he likes his scrambles and so forth, and you know maybe he'll catch Figueredo in something in one of these scrambles, a submission. But I'm not overly sold on Benavidez's uh, wrestling either, and Figueredo he can be taken down, but uh, outside of the Formiga fight, who is a good top position grappler. He's shown he can get back to his feet. So uh, the pick for me is Figueredo. So that wraps up the picks, guys. I'll be back next week for next week's picks. As I said at the start, packages available pro MMABetting.com. Only £195 for 12 months live betting and pre-betting tips. Looking at around 100 events that you're going to have access to for betting purposes, whether it be live betting or pre-betting. 
members who bet £100 per unit won £14,500 last year. All bets are tracked. There's links to all the trackers below this video. They're also on the website prommabetting.com. We put all of our bet slips and stakes on Twitter. There's no cloak and dagger approach, no paper trading. We bet what we're tipping and we put our balls on the line because we're betting four-figure money on these pre-bets. So if you'd like more information, you can find me on Twitter at ProMMABetting. Like the video, please subscribe and we'll be back next week.